Okay, welcome. I'm Brian Wilson. I'm the director of CSU's Engines and Energy Conversion Laboratory, and I really want to talk about three words today, energy, innovation, and impact. So my definition of energy is this one. I like it. I, as an engineer, I can say it's uh, uh, f related to force and work, but it's really the ability to do work. And I like this because it has a definition that applies to the mechanics, but it also has refers to the utility. Um, energy is what we use to do useful things. <clears throat> energy is used by the planet. It's important to the planet. Um, and uh, here in Fort Collins, uh, we're playing our uh, we play a role in that. Uh, this is the Engines and Energy Conversion Laboratory. It's just a few hundred uh, yards from here uh, to the old Fort Collins power plant. And this was actually one of the most innovative energy facilities of its time when it was built back in 1935. Uh, the city of Fort Collins used to be part of the public service company uh, energy system, and they decided they wanted a more responsible, more innovative system. So essentially, they seceded uh, from public service companies, established their own utility. Um, the building was uh, stopped generating power in 1972. Uh, it ceased being used uh, by the city in 1988, and we took it over in 1992 to establish the Engines and Energy Conversion Laboratory. And I like to think that we, once again in this building, are doing uh, innovative, cutting edge work putting Fort Collins on the map in terms of innovation. Which brings us to the issue of innovation. Now, innovation, Andy Hargadon at uh, uh, UC Davis talks about innovation uh, as the generation and ex exploitation of novel, valuable, and non-obvious solutions. Um, it has a role, what we're talking about today, it has a role in invention, and we'll be talking about technologies but it also has a role in uh, uh, how we disseminate those solutions is very much part of the innovation process. So also from Andy Hargadon um, is that uh, innovation is about the difference between an idea that quietly dies and the same idea in another's hands that changes companies and industries. And I'm gonna make the case that many of the things that we talk about today really have been done before. In some cases, they've been done many times, even thousands of times, but have not achieved impact. So I'd like to think that uh, in addition to developing technologies, we're also developing models of dissemination that lead to innovation. And finally, uh, impact. And this is my definition, which is the impact is innovation at scale. A couple of people who have commented, uh, it made similar statements. Steve Jobs talks about make a dent in the universe. If we're going to do something, let's do it at a scale that has impact. And another hero of mine is uh, Paul Pollack. Uh, he was a founder of a group called IDE. Uh, and uh, they did water pumps in, in Bangladesh. And other people had done those, you know, a few dozen, a few hundred. Uh, Paul figured out a way to do three million. And he's a crusty old guy, uh, and uh, he says this somewhat to be controversial. But I think it's true. If you're going to do something, uh, it, it's not necessarily harder to do it at scale. So I'm going to talk now about what we've done. And I'm going to uh, talk about three examples, uh, engines, cook stoves, and algae. Now, they seem disconnected, but they all the, the common theme here is innovation, developing innovative energy solutions, disseminating them at a wide scale through innovative uh, dissemination structures. <clears throat> and we are motivated uh, at the laboratory uh, by the idea that our research only has impact when solutions are implemented at a massive scale. Uh, a traditional academic model is that we do a piece of work we publish a paper, and it goes in an archival journal. 
and that word archival has kind of a dusty connotation. Uh, that for us, that's really that's where it begins. Uh, we want to go beyond that uh, to turn um, research into solutions, turn solutions into products, and make sure those products get disseminated. So uh, when we established the laboratory, we began working on engines. And one thing that became very clear is that it's very difficult to move innovation into the automotive industry. So we don't work in automotive. We looked around to see where we could have impact and decided it was in the field of industrial engines. These are the big engines that are used for compressing natural gas on the pipeline system. They used to produce a lot of emissions. Um, and the industry was under some very stringent timelines to dramatically reduce their emissions by over 80% uh, at the time. But there was no place to actually test these technologies. So uh, shortly after moving into the laboratory in 1992, we began setting up a facility uh, to allow us to develop technologies to reduce the emissions from this class of engines. Uh, we worked with uh, many different companies. We worked with uh, uh, Woodward Governor here in town, uh, uh, companies in uh, other parts of the US and Europe and developed a suite of technologies. One of them was called high pressure fuel injection. Uh, and with this, we showed that we could reduce emissions by over 90% and typically save maybe 8 to 10% on fuel consumption. So it actually had a negative cost of implementation. We worked to uh, uh, then worked with several different companies uh, to turn that into solutions and help those solutions then become disseminated across the pipeline. And the, uh, the upshot of this is uh, now that uh, a suite of technologies that we've either developed or helped other companies to develop have been widely disseminated. Almost every engine on the US natural gas pipeline system uses technology we developed. And in the, the net result of that is reduction of NOx emissions by the same amount as removing about 120 million modern automobiles from the highway. So this is uh, the type of thing we're talking about when we talk about trying to have impact. We continue work on large engines. Uh, this is a 1.8 megawatt uh, engine used for electric power generation. And because of this work that we're doing on these engines um, has allowed us to build the um, Integrid, the uh, smart grid laboratory that is at the core of the Fort Z, Fort Collins Zero Energy District project um, and our uh, uh, program with the Department of Energy that the community has been very involved with. But it, uh, this facility was originally funded by the government of Denmark to figure out how to use wind energy more effectively in Denmark. Um, and the uh, reason that we're doing this work is that the people had developed solutions to integrate more uh, renewables onto the grid. Um, government of Denmark was very interested because they're pretty much at the, they're, they're a leader in the utilization of renewables, particularly wind. And when the wind speed changes, that causes instabilities on the grid. Um, before they can go beyond this, they had to resolve those, uh, uh, those instabilities. Solutions were proposed, but they needed to be tested in a laboratory at large scale. So we weren't doing grid work at the time, but we do big stuff. So that's how we began that work. So uh, and on engines, we do a lot of cool stuff. We use lasers to ignite the mixture. We use the most advanced computational techniques. And so it's, it's fun working at the edge of high tech. But really, one of our most important energy problems is cooking. Half the world's population cook on solid fuels, on wood, dung, or crop residues. The smoke from cook stoves kills over 2 million people a year. There's a global need for 600 million cook stoves. We've had thousands of cook stove programs over the last 40 years. 40 years ago, we needed 300 million cook stoves. Now we need 600 million cook stoves. We aren't even keeping up with the scale of the problem. We've been doing work in this in the laboratory for about a decade. Uh, we built, uh, we have probably the most advanced laboratory for, for doing scientific research on cook stoves. Um, I've worked uh, all over the world to help um, uh, improve cook stove programs. This is a, from a program we did with UC Berkeley in uh, China. Um, this is from Africa. We've also worked in Latin America. However, the model of cook stove dissemination is broken. The typical rationale goes like this. Uh, 
Poor people use cook stoves. Poor people need jobs. Let's give them jobs in the local villages building cook stoves that they then use. The challenge with that is that cook stoves are technology products. Uh, we don't build cell phones in every village. Um, building cook stoves in every village hasn't worked either. We begin to uh, talk about the brokenness of that model. And about uh, three, three and a half years ago, uh, the Shell Foundation came to us and, and really uh, said that they agreed with that model and challenged us to set up large-scale production of cook stoves. So we've taken a systems approach uh, to cook stove development in partnership with a company that we launched in the laboratory in 2003 called EnviroFit International. EnviroFit was founded originally to disseminate technology we had developed to reduce pollution from two-stroke cycle uh, engines. Uh, originally for snowmobiles, then we developed the technology uh, to, to reduce pollution from two-stroke cycle engines used in Asia. But uh, because it was, this really represented one of the first times that people had taken a mature approach to developing product, technology products specifically for the developing world. So we partnered together, um, sort of put the band back together, uh, and applied modern techniques to, to develop new cook stove products, things like computational fluid dynamics, chemical kinetic modeling. Uh, we actually developed new alloys uh, to allow us uh, to get long life at low cost. And the solution uh, was um, a series of cook stoves. This is actually, I think, the fifth model that we introduced, but um, also taking advantage of uh, uh, modern uh, design, uh, design techniques, uh, design for manufacturing, uh, product design, uh, but also trying to produce an aesthetic product. We want to build products that people want to own. We want to build aspirational products because we need people to buy the products because no one is going to write a check large enough for 600 million cook stoves. Uh, these stoves have now been uh, disseminated and we've also uh, we've set up uh, distribution organizations globally. Um, in India, for example, we distribute through wholesalers and local retailers, through village entrepreneurs, through women's health self-help groups. We have vans that go around uh, with a Bollywood movie that we show about cook stoves. Um, we have different models in Africa, different models um, in Latin America. But the result of this is we've been shipping stoves for a little over two years, and we've uh, sold about 250,000 stoves. We should sell about 300,000 cook stoves in the next 12 months. So uh, that's a lot. It's more than anyone else has sold. But again, we need 600 million. So uh, Glenn talks about exponential growth and doubling. That's what we need here. We need to continue with exponential growth to meet that demand. And the last technology I'm going to talk about is, uh, is algae. Um, uh, then this is another company we established in the laboratory in 2006 called Solix Biofuels. Uh, we've developed technology for the large-scale production of biofuels from algae. We developed uh, uh, systems um, that um, allow us to build photobioreactors at very low cost and very high productivity. Um, and then we have now uh, are working to implement those at scale. This is a cartoon I had uh, put together, oh, probably three years ago, uh, to create a vision of what large-scale production would look like. Now, it shows a couple of things. Number one, it shows um, that these are surrounding a coal-fired power plant. It's because to grow algae, we actually need a source of carbon dioxide. So we consume carbon dioxide and produce a useful product. The second thing I've shown this uh, in the desert, uh, and that's because we can put these in areas uh, where we don't compete for food production, uh, in the deserts, even offshore. Uh, we've implemented this now um, on a, uh, the Southern Ute Indian Reservation outside of uh, Durango. Uh, there's three basins here. Each has about 60,000 liters of culture. So this is, uh, we believe, is the lar largest photobioreactor system for biofuels production. But uh, really, this is, uh, this is not uh, economical at this scale, but it was really done to demonstrate uh, the challenges we would face as we begin to scale up. It's worthwhile to note that this work is, uh, Solix is a for-profit company funded by folks such as Valero Energy, who's the largest energy refiner in the U.S., um, the uh, Southern Ute Indian tribe, uh, who uh, 
uh, have a very interesting approach to sustainability. They actually make business decisions thinking about the seventh generation, as Glenn alluded to, uh, and even the city of Shanghai. So uh, very, uh, very uh, wide variety. So that's what we've done. Uh, how do we do it? We've uh, set out from the beginning with a methodical approach to developing technology solutions for important problems, and then from the beginning, working to drive implementation on a massive scale. Uh, we develop technology, so we, we, we do first-rate uh, R&D. Uh, we've got about a dozen faculty members, uh, uh, several dozen graduate students, and, uh, and a thundering horde of undergraduates who work in the laboratory. Um, we develop, but then we, uh, we develop, turn that technology into solutions, so we don't stop at the paper. But then, that's just the beginning, because we then have to work towards production. Um, in many cases, if it's a fairly radical concept, we may actually have to establish production and even distribution. So we'll actually become involved in public awareness, in sales, and in logistics. So uh, maybe uh, types of things that normally don't happen in the normal academic uh, uh, model, but it's what we found that we need to do to have impact with our work. And this is a model we're now applying all over the university. It's also important that there's things that we don't work on. We don't work on stuff that doesn't work. <laughs> and it turns out there's actually can be a lot of money for stuff that doesn't work. And I'm probably being somewhat heretical here, but fuel cells were something that just really haven't worked. There's been a lot of money put into them. Um, another technology called microturbines. And both of these represented funding opportunities that we stepped away from because we just didn't want to spend our time on something that ultimately wasn't going to be useful. Uh, we don't work on things that don't make sense. Um, hydrogen has uh, something that we, we reinvent about every five to seven years, and we have for about the last hundred years. Um, and first generation biofuels uh, really, really don't make sense if you think about taking those to scale. Corn ethanol um, from standard first generation uh, starch based production. Uh, and there's things that don't scale. We tend not to do one-off projects. We don't do consultancies. We're going to work on something. We want to work on it at a scale that can have impact. So finally, uh, for us, what's, uh, what's next? Um, <clears throat> we just uh, established a joint research institute in China uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, formalized that. We're working at energy materials, uh, device design, manufacturing, Geographic information systems for energy systems, human behavior, education, energy, and environment. Why are we in China? Uh, because China is vitally important for energy. They're now the largest energy user. They're the largest greenhouse gas producer. They're the largest producer of energy solutions. Um, the, f energy, the future of energy technology, uh, China will be dominant in that field. Um, and no one can take things to scale like China. Uh, so, uh, and, there, and there's, I mean, I, and I say that with, um, uh, with knowledge of, of the, some of the challenges of working in China. But it's something that I believe that because of the importance of, with that, um, we need to have real engagement. I want our students to have the opportunity for real engagement uh, because whether they're collaborators or competitors, China will be dominant in this field in the future. For us, um, we've outgrown uh, where we are. We, uh, uh, we looked uh, about a, uh, even, even a year ago, uh, uh, Mike Freeman and I, we were looking at uh, moving the laboratory on campus where we could uh, scale up. But in partnership uh, with um, a lot of folks, we've come up with a plan that allows us to scale up the facility on our current site. Now, this still has uh, many steps to go in the uh, planning, permitting process. But we hope to have these uh, done uh, by the end of the year to begin construction, hopefully um, early next year. And things you see here is that, um, you know, for this, the building itself will also be a model in, of innovation. We'll can, algae on the roof, solar, wind, geothermal, smart lighting systems, smart building control systems. Uh, we will be using this as a uh, platform to really demonstrate and develop next generation building technologies because building energy use is such a high part of the energy mix. 
So what I've talked about today um, are the work that we're doing in energy. We're developing energy technologies, but we've tried to do it in, a, in an innovation manner that allows those developments to turn into products that can then ultimately have impact. Thank you.